Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Ciccarelli from Doctors Unmasked. And as you can see, we're in an actual operating room with expensive robotic equipment around us. This sets the stage for our conversation today with Dr. Chad Weber, an expert in the Dayton community with robotic joint replacement. I think you'll find this segment very fascinating. Stay tuned. So hi, we're here today to start the conversation with Dr. Chad Weber, a noted orthopedic physician in Dayton, Ohio. And Chad, I understand that you are now doing robotic total knees, is that correct? Correct. So I know that you started your practice 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and when you first started, you were doing what's called a traditional total knee, correct? Manual instrumentation, yep. Okay, could, could you tell our audience a little bit about what manual instrumentation is? Uh, manual instrumentation is basically where you put rods, most, they have intramedullary and extramedullary rods where you put them up the femur and down the tibia to get your overall alignments. Uh, there's certain cutting blocks that we use that you have to pin to the femur, and then through those blocks, you actually make the cuts uh, to make the end of the femur shaped, how the implants are actually shaped. Um, there, we at one point thought they were really, really precise. We've had good outcomes with them over time, but uh, there's definitely a learning curve with that. And um, there's just things that have came along the way that have led me down the path that I take now. So I understand now that you've done over 200, what's called robotic total joints, is that correct? Yep. And does every hospital have the ability to do robotic total joints? Nope. Um, the robot that I use is the Mako robot, um, a Stryker's product. And um, there's only two locally that places that I work at that have the robots. So not all the hospitals are automatically getting the robot. So as I understand it, there's very few orthopedic physicians then that are actually trained in robotic total joint replacement and probably nobody has done as many as you, is that correct? In the Dayton area, I was the first one to kind of start doing them. I've done over 200. I don't know of maybe two or three other positions that are actually using the robot. Um, I do my surgeries at Wayne and Grandview, and um, I'm the only one of three at Wayne, and then at Grandview, there's only myself that's done them so far. Okay. Or two, two, I should say two. So in your transition from doing a standard total knee to the robotic total knee, mm -hmm. what, what have you found to be the biggest advantages to you and then to the patient who's had a robotic joint? Um, I mean, there's several. I mean, I think the biggest advantage to me is, is that I took the time to basically go learn how to do it. And um, I think I can offer my patients a, a better total joint than someone who does it conventionally. Uh, I'm not saying that those aren't good total joints. In my opinion, I think the majority of the implants today are the same. Made of metal, those metals haven't changed for a long time. For a while there, a lot of the technology was in the plastic, which is the pieces between the two pieces of metal that kind of gives the cushion and on the back side of the kneecap. Um, but again, those have became very, very, for the most part, the same or uh, very similar. Very similar and last a long, long time. Right. So how could I separate myself um, from what everybody else was doing. And the only thing that I could think of was put it in better, which makes it last longer. Um, the last thing you want to do is put a total joint in it and have it fail really, really early. So I thought I better be able to put them in better than everybody else if I want to be the guy that's doing that. So, so I know that, that one of the main reasons that joints fail early is because they're not put in either in proper alignment correct. or they're either put in too tight or too loose, which mm -hmm. then causes undue stress on the joint, is yeah. that correct? Yep. So I think it's like using the analogy of putting a brand new set of tires on your car. Absolutely. If you put them in aligned properly and balanced properly, they're gonna last longer. Yep. Okay. So what you see behind you then on that screen, would mm -hmm. that be representative of what you would go into a surgical case looking at in the operating room? Yeah, so every person who gets a robotic total hip or total knee, they get a preoperative CT scan. Off of that CT scan, um, it goes off and there's certain landmarks that uh, they mark for us to kind of look at. Um, myself and Gianna, we go through every, um, basically, test, uh, every CT scan. 
and we come up with a plan for that patient because we're really wanting to correct two things. One, we want to take out all of their arthritis. And number two is, you know, sometimes that's just genetic, but a lot of times these people have fairly big deformities of, you know, they're really bow-legged, they're really knock kneed and if we put them in and they leave them like that, then they're probably going to wear those things out really, really quick. So the goal is, is to correct the deformity and take out the arthritis, so we're allowed to look at that and see what we may need to do in order to correct that. A lot of that's taken care of in surgery, we have the plan, and then intraoperatively, we basically take certain measurements, we put a couple pins in here and a couple pins in the femur, um, it's all through one incision, specifically in the knee, and the hip currently we can do it through one small one and the regular one, but off of that, before we take any bone or anything like that, we get an initial measurement. Uh, then we do some soft tissue releases, we take off all the bone spurs, we release certain ligaments that we may need to do in order to correct that deformity, and we correct it. And through that, it allows us to say, we can correct this much through soft tissue releases and plastic versus having to cut bone. And once we get that estimation, then we, make, then we come up with the final plan, size everything, which we usually have a great idea going into that, and then decide what type of plastic, size plastic that we need. So once you have this plan, you then use a device like this. Yep. This is actually the robot. Yep. And you would manually use this saw, correct? Correct. And so, it pretty much limits the excursion. That, so you absolutely. can't take off no. more or less than what your not measurements unless, showed. Not unless the, she allows me to do that, really. But it's one of those things where um, that's the precision of it. If you want to take one millimeter, if you tell this thing to take one millimeter, it takes one millimeter. Okay. If you say, I want to be at one degree, it puts you at one degree. There's not like maybe five or one degree, it's one degree. Gotcha. Uh, so it's really the precision. In the preoperative plan, one of the biggest things is, is you want to make this thing feel as normal as possible. So it's called functional implant positioning where you really put the implant back as close to their normal anatomy as possible and see how it fits. Um, you know, one of the things with the conventional stuff was, one of the biggest problems was the patellofemoral, your kneecap not tracking right. One of the biggest things I've seen in my patients is, is no one really has that. It's always sitting right in the center where it's supposed to and it's balanced the way it's supposed to, which um, has taken away a lot of the problems. And um, another distinct advantage is not having to put a rod inside a bone minimizes the risk of blood clots going to the lung, correct? Absolutely. Yep. Or if they've had a broken bone yep. and you can't get that rod past that deformity, yep. then you're probably compromising the positioning of the implant where with a robot, you can take all that into account yep. and not have to deal with that. As I correct? use it with my history of doing trauma. I've had a ton of people who have, you know, a ton of hardware still left in there. Uh, we just did a case not that long ago where a guy had an acetabulum fracture Four months after he had a fracture, the head died. We had a ton of uh, screws in his pelvis, but we were able to really do that and know that we were going to have to take out this screw and this screw before we got in there so that it allows us to, to do that. So it's minimal bone resection, it's less blood loss. Uh, surgery time for me is about neutral, so doing it conventional, doing it with just plain navigation without the robotic arm doing the cut, uh, it's all about time neutral. So. Let me ask you some very direct questions then. Mm -hmm. So the biggest complication that I remember from total joint replacement was having the hip pop out of socket or dislocate. Yep. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that using the robotic guidance minimizes that complication? Yep. The cup is, you can prove it, look at the preoperative plan and whatever their anatomy was before, and it may not be perfect of what they were, Often you can check the other side, but if you want them at 20 degrees and 40 degrees to have the appropriate measurements that the books say, you can put them right at that. And, and as I understand it, Chad, you're also using an anterior approach, yep. is that correct? Yep. We can do it through any approach. You can do it through anterior approach. You can use, which the anterior approach is actually the hardest at this point to use the um, robot through because of where some of the, the, the checkpoints are but their new system is supposed to be coming out. Actually, it's out in some places um, uh, where you can actually make it easier. I use it on, I don't really do a posterior approach unless I'm doing acetabulum stuff, but through anterior lateral, you can use it through any really approach. Okay, so an anterior approach to the people watching this means that 
the incision is more towards the front yep. rather than along the back of the hip where it used to be conventional. Right. Okay. And most most hip dislocations have always been posterior, right. and they've always thought that that has a higher risk of dislocation. Again, it's one of those things where if you put it in right, it probably shouldn't dislocate. Okay. So as far as the knee goes, then, mm -hmm. I know that the majority of issues that people would have afterwards would be certainly stiffness or loss of motion. Um, maybe the kneecap didn't track right. Uh, maybe they felt that the knee was either too tight or too loose. Are, are these some of the things that you feel that you've corrected or, or improved your ability since you started using the sure. robotic surgery? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, range of motion for me at, week, at two weeks, I want them at least at 90. Um, when I was doing conventional, um, I would say I was happy if they came at like 65 to 70. I'm mean, gonna have people come in at, especially in partials and the bicomps where you only replace two parts versus one part. Those people show up with basically full range of motion. Totals, I'm happy if they're at 90, but there are those people that come in and are less than that. It happens way less than it used to. There's people that come in and they're zero to 120, which is near full motion right. at two weeks. So it really, it, it helps people get their motion back much quicker, I think, in my patients is what I've seen. So, again, understanding that the audience may not understand everything, a partial replacement means what? So a partial replacement, you can do a partial replacement where you just, re I say that there's three compartments of the joint, basically inside, outside, and behind your kneecap. If there's somebody who just has isolated arthritis in one of those compartments, then you can just use the robot to replace one of those. Um, you so that would be the picture that we have behind us with correct. metal on just one side, is that correct? Correct. We can also do what we've done a bike, what we call a bicomp, which is bicompartmental, meaning two compartments, the inside compartment and behind your kneecap, or the outside compartment and behind your kneecap, which without the robot, um, I would say it's very, very, technically difficult to do uh, and it's not that I, I've only seen one which we changed over today but um, very very difficult to have two implants individual and make everything line up without the precision of the robot sure because you're talking one or two millimeters that you have to have between them and can easily not go well sure so Chad if people have had a joint replacement say years ago and now they're having pain again mm -hmm or if they know their components loose and, and they were told they have to have a new knee or a hip done, yep. is that something that you with your robotic technique can address? Yes, it's one of those things where it's considered off-label use at this point to do a revision using the robot. Um, we have converted um, several partials with you know, one compartment or the bike compartment, the patellofemoral and the, the other compartment using the robot. Um, Again, it's a, definitely what we would consider a progressive case. Uh, they're really fun to do. But so this is the fun part of the segment. I get to take my mask off as a physician and play the role of a patient in your office. So I'm going to ask you questions that a patient may ask you or may forget to ask you. And I'd like you to answer them as if you're talking directly to me, the patient. Okay. So I've seen you and you've recommended a total joint, but I'm still on the fence about how I should do this. So tell me again why I should have this robotically and what you think the advantages to me, the patient, would be. We know that you have really bad arthritis. We've been treating it for a long, long time. We've done multiple injections. You've exhausted all of your conservative care. It's time that we have talked about doing a re knee replacement. Um, I think by doing that robotically, one, we're taking out the arthritis. You also are pretty bow-legged, so, or your knock knee, whichever one of those that you may be, we're able to correct that deformity to exactly how we would want it to be. So we can achieve both of those goals. And by doing that with the robot, we're able to put it in more precisely. Um, I think people get their range of motion back sooner. You're not having rods shoved up and down your tibia, less pain, which everybody's about having less pain. And it allows them to get back doing the things, in my opinion, sooner than they would if I did it without the robot. How long would I have to be in the hospital? Usually, usually most people today leave that day or the next day. Usually one night in the hospital. Well, when Unless I they have other medical conditions or, you know, cardiac, cardiac, you know, cardiac history, lungs, okay. anything like that, then you would probably stay 
maybe another night. But okay. so I'm a fairly healthy patient. You're thinking I could come in on a Thursday, have my surgery, maybe go home Thursday afternoon or Friday. Correct. You'll work with therapy before you leave. But I always want everybody to work with therapy. You work with therapy that day of surgery for sure. If you go home that day, you go home. If you stay overnight, then you get up the next morning, work with therapy, and make sure everything's labs check out, pain's controlled, you got all your scripts, everything you need to go home, and then go home. So once I'm home, how soon will I be able to get up and walk with either crutches or a walker? You're walking the day of surgery. So you walk the day of surgery as soon as you know, you're up on the floor, therapy comes, sees you, we get you up walking that day. The sooner you walk, the better off you are. The sooner you get up and move, the easier it is for you um, to, to, to continue to get better and progress. So it's my right knee. When will I be able to drive? I tell everybody, uh, you can't be on your pain medicine and you know you have to have your reaction time. I don't want anybody driving a long period of distance. I would say average, I tell people somewhere between four to six weeks would be the earliest. If you can have somebody drive for you that long, then have somebody else drive for you. Okay. Left side, I would say, you know, off your pain meds, um, probably two to four weeks. So I'm an avid golfer. When do you think having my hip replaced? Let's talk about a hip replacement. Okay. How, how soon after I have my hip replaced do you think I'd be able to golf? Uh, through an anterior approach, I will usually tell people when I see them at two weeks, they can go out in the yard and just start to chip and putt. Um, I usually don't let them play, you know, full round till I see them after the six to eight weeks. Um, I've had people who have played sooner than that. Um, I've had people who have played sooner than that and been really, really, really sore and said, I'm not doing that again. But uh, I would say, you know, probably three months would be average sure. when you could go out, maybe ride nine holes, chip putt, and hit all the clubs that you want. Okay. So. What would you say to a person who maybe is an accountant and sits at their desk all day at a job? Mm -hmm. How soon after a knee replacement do you think they'd be able to go to a sit-down type job? I tell everybody I want them taking the first two weeks off unless they can you know, do something from home. I really want them to focus on those first two weeks of physical therapy, of working on getting your motion back, getting your pain under control, getting your swelling down. Um, after that, I kind of leave it up to the patient as far as, you know, how how soon do you feel like going back? Can you get up and move around? Can you, you have to stay seated? Can you get up and walk around five minutes every hour? You know, can you have ice on your knee? There's several factors that kind of, you know, goes Plenty into, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I have one final question, Chad, as a patient. My impression of a robotic surgery is that there's actually a robot standing over me doing my procedure and you are either in the room, in a corner, or maybe not even in the room. Is, yeah. is that accurate? <laughs> I get asked that question all the time. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a robotic arm, it's right behind you there. I actually, you know, I still do the approach, and I'm very involved in the case, and the robot doesn't do anything that I don't tell it to do. It doesn't activate. If I, the only way that it really works is if I pull the trigger. It only lets me do it if it's exactly perfect, and that's how those, the precision comes from it. But I have to activate it, and I'm right in surgery. So I do the approach, I do the soft tissue releases. You know, basically the robot is for coming up with a plan and executing that plan to precision of bone cuts. The soft tissue, there's still an art to right. of doing the replacement with the soft tissue releases and those type of things to still make it, you know, my job sure. important, you know, like, so a, a, a better way to say the surgery is probably more robotic assisted robotic surgery. Arm, robotic arm assisted. Yes. You're doing the surgery, you're controlling the robotic arm yep. to do the procedure. Yep. And it'll only allow you to do what you program. What we told to do. So in closing this segment of Doctors Unmasked, I'd like to point out a fact that over a million total joints are done in America every year. If you're one of those people considering having your joint replaced, why not think about doing it robotically? Thank you. This has been Dr. Brian Ciccarelli, Doctors Unmasked.